Hello and welcome back to Build a CubeSat. I'm Manuel and today we are taking a look at the CubeSat prototype hardware I'll be sending to the Stratosphere, all manufactured by PCBWay who are sponsoring today's video. So I have received the CNC parts and PCBs last week and I have just started assembling the PCBs. As you may know, all of this is open source and freely available on the repo, the link to which you will find in the description. Let me now show you how all of this will go together in Blender. As we have discussed in the previous video, I have a 2 kilo mass budget for this flight, which includes everything that's attached to the balloon. Therefore, I'm going with a 1.5 unit size. Also, I would need a larger size at the moment because I'm trying to focus on the basics. So starting at the power supply, I will use a 2S2P configuration with the new minimal EPS. I will only need one buck module because only buck bus A will be used, so this connector right here on the Y- minus side. And this will also be the new simpler buck module design that's based on a Tex Instruments uh, TPSM 5D 1806. I will also use only one solar charging module to make things a bit simpler, and this will still be the LTM 8062 based one. Maybe this is a good moment to mention that a lot about this configuration is just specific to this one high altitude balloon test flight and it's not intended to mimic something that would actually be launched to space. For example, I'm not going to test any RBF features or deployment switches which would be absolutely fundamental for a real space-based CubeSat mission. Um, I have talked about the goals for this flight in the previous video a bit, so if you're curious to learn more, maybe go check that out. Let's now continue on the C plus side of the prototype. Here we have two Micromod carrier boards that are connected with these 17mm um, long backbus interconnects. The backbus interconnect below the EPS is the 32mm variant that reaches all the way through the EPS bay to the C- side of the prototype. Honestly, I would like to take a moment to appreciate how well these interconnect boards have turned out. The hard gold plating is a thing of beauty and PCBWay has done a great job with the V-scoring on the panel. They kind of snap apart um, cleanly and with a very satisfying feeling. So maybe let me know in the comments if you would be interested in a video about panelizing these. But now back to the prototype. So both of the Micromod carrier boards are outfitted with RP2040 processor boards. These SparkFun PCBs I have converted from the original Eagle projects don't have any components on them because I didn't take the time to uh, find and or relink the 3D models. And by the way, before I forget, I use the awesome PCB to Blender plugin for both KiCad and um, Blender to export the 3D models of all of these boards. So if you don't know it and if you use both of these programs, I can highly recommend it. It's, it's pretty amazing. So the top Micromod carrier board has a Blues Wireless function board that both integrates LT and GPS. And the bottom one has separate function boards for LoRa and GPS. One thing to mention about the LoRa Micromod function board is that it has a 915 MHz LoRa module on it, which I will have to swap out for an 868 MHz one because that's the frequency we mainly use for LoRa in Europe. So moving on to the C- side of the prototype now, we have the Raspberry Pi Compute Module 5 carrier board with the Compute Module 5 on it and two Raspberry Pi cameras. The Compute Module 5 itself has no RF downlink connectivity um, once we leave the Wi-Fi range at the launch site, so we won't be getting any image data back from that until we physically retrieve the payload. Let's now unhide the structure so we can discuss the rest of it. So to each end of the prototype I will add one of these cheese plate boards which are still a preliminary design that I would like to test out. To these I will attach the antennas, the C- camera and also the backup camera system which will be a DJI Air Unit 04 Pro. So on this cheese plate there is a hole pattern in a 20mm spacing that's intended to be used with uh, nuts and bolts, but there's also a 10 millimeter grid of pilot holes in case you need to drill additional holes. So this design still has a few issues, um, the most significant of which probably is that there's an interference with the bolt head, which causes the surface of this cheese plate to be about a millimeter proud of the rail end, which is of course a big no-no. Um, it will work just fine for this test flight, but it's something to take care of in the next revision. As I have just mentioned, one of the things that will be attached to the cheese plate will be the DJI Air Unit. So the main body can go directly on the cheese plate, but the little camera head, if you will, will need to stick out on a boom that I will 
3D print, which is completely fine for this application. And that is a prime example of something that is very specific for this high altitude balloon test flight and you wouldn't do it this way on a real CubeSat. So come to think of it, actually, the whole boom thing could also go on the C plus side and so the camera would be looking down instead. Let me know in the comments if you have a preference for this. Um, I think either direction would work just fine for me. Another very high altitude balloon specific thing that I would like on the C minus side is this tiny LiDAR module. Uh, mainly to get a precise reading on the descent rate right before touchdown. I suspect that I won't have enough time to integrate this, but I'll try. So looking at this stack up now, it looks kind of uneven because it's pretty top heavy and there's a lot of um, free space at the bottom. So what I would like to do next is select everything that's relevant and just uh, move the whole thing down by one notch and one notch being 10 millimeters. When you do that, we have to make sure that this alignment slot in the rail aligns with the matching alignment slot in the EPS bay about like this. And yeah, this looks better already. So I think if we were using the shorter backbus interconnect, so the 12 millimeter variant, this may even fit in a one use size, which would be kind of a, a kind of cool minimal CubeSat configuration. One thing that is quite obviously missing from this model are the PCB clamps that would be bolted onto the inside of the rails right around here and here. So I have finally gotten these to a point where the tolerances are just right after uh, more rounds of tweaking them than I care to admit. But because I wasn't sure that they were going to work, I only ordered two pairs of them from PCBWay. So for this test flight, I will have to come up with a temporary, much simpler solution and probably 3D print it, uh, which, is, which will be fine because we don't really care about outgassing for this test flight. And also we don't have to worry about vibration, so using 3D printed parts is completely okay. And for future flights I will just order more of those from PCBWay. So these are the main parts of the prototype. As you have seen there is quite a lot that receives or transmits RF signals, so let's talk about the whole RF situation next. Starting at the payload, I would like to try and get a video stream down from the C- camera at least until we drift out of Wi-Fi range. With around 7 meters per second of ascent speed and an unknown spin rate, it's likely to lose connection rather quickly. But to give it a fighting chance, I opted for this omnidirectional PCB antenna on the C- side. On the ground, we will have this active directional 5 GHz antenna with an integrated access point. Then for LoRa on 868 MHz, I will be using this 5 dBi WIP antenna on the flight segment. There will be two separate receivers on the ground. One will be a manually tracked Yagi Uda on the launch site and an omnidirectional dipole on my friend's balcony. I ordered all of these LoRa antennas directly from Paradar in the UK, mainly because they have a solid reputation. For GPS, I will use these small ceramic patch antennas and for LTE, one of these stubby ones. And for the remaining devices, the GPS trackers have their own internal antennas and the APRS transmitter has a chip antenna for GPS and just needs a monopole for APRS, which is just a thin wire cut to about 50 centimeters length. The DJI Air unit, of course, has its own proprietary antennas. Now regarding the side panels, um, the Y- and Y- sides will be covered in solar panels and I will leave the X- side uncovered, uh, mainly so that my friends at the launch can take a peek inside, but also like this, the second Raspberry Pi camera can look out that way actually. Now, as I have mentioned in the previous video, um, this flight will be dedicated to a dear friend of mine who has passed away a few years ago. So I would like to have um, one of his designs on the X plus side panel. It's this uh, quirky, somewhat weird and, you know, just profoundly good natured thing that he made uh, a few years ago and that's quintessentially him. So I, I'm thinking this is a fitting tribute for this flight. Thanks also to my friends Anis and Thierry who helped me uh, choose this one. So since this design needs these vibrant colors, I will have it UV printed on a PCB by PCB way. Um, on the back of that panel, I will have an array of footprints for solder nuts to support various camera mounting positions and also just some bare pads in case I need to patch something together uh, last minute. I've actually never had anything printed in full color on a PCB before, but it seems super easy to do. Um, basically, you just need to send in the image along with the Gerber, so in the same zip file, that's important. 
And when you place the order, you just select this option under UV printing multicolor. Now the image doesn't need to contain any specific markers, but of course they need a, a way to align it with the, with the PCB. So what I did is I used the edge cuts I exported from Fusion 360 and used in KiCad anyway to also mask out the image. So looking at the PCB and the image side by side, it's pretty clear how the outlines and these mounting holes should be aligned. Just to be sure, I sent these files to my sales rep Remy and uh, she confirmed that this is going to work. But she did point out again that the image file needs to be in the same zip as the Gerber files. In case you aren't sure if your image is going to work, I'd recommend you do the same and um, reach out to them before placing the order. So yeah, I'm really excited to see how this is going to turn out. So going back to the 3D model, I think the only thing left to add is some nylon string to hitch the whole thing to the balloon. For this, I will use these um, deployment switch plunger holes that are currently not being used because we don't have any deployment switches yet. So these are on the C plus side and I will also do the same on the C minus side to hold the prototype down prior to release. And this is basically it for the prototype. I will be spending the next few weeks assembling it and I'll make sure to let you know how this goes. Let's now talk about the concept of operations or conops for the launch. I will launch the balloon from a wide and empty field so it doesn't get caught in a tree right after liftoff. A few years ago I have put together a kind of launch tower which is partially to get the prototype off the ground so it's a bit easier to work on it, but honestly it's also a bit of spectacle for the guests. So this will be at the center of the whole thing. Um, to the left of the launch tower I will have a table to work on the auxiliary parts like the watertight bag with the uh, GPS tracker and the signal light and the APRS transmitter and so on. And even a bit further to the left I'll just have a bit of tarp to roll out the, the balloon on. Uh, it's important that the balloon stays um, dry and clean so uh, the, the latex doesn't get weakened. Um, so it bursts when it should burst. And of course close to all of this there will be a cart with the helium cylinder on it. So um, this is kind of the area for the filling operations. Then somewhere over here we will have an inflatable tent for the guests with some snacks and drinks, which is um, not too far from the filling operations but also not too close because I tend to get little tents in these, in these situations and I need some room to work. Then to the right of the launch tower I will put a flight case which will hold all of the electronics. So this includes a large power bank for AC power, um, my laptop for monitoring uh, prototype health and also all of the live stream stuff. This will actually be my first time live streaming or attempting to live stream anything. So um, it does add some complexity to the launch but I think it will be worth it. A couple of friends will be helping me with operating the camera, so there will be at least one mobile one connected with a DJI SDR um, wireless image transmitter and one that will just be on a tripod to track the payload. So that one will be a Nikon P1000, mainly because of its ridiculous 24 to 3000 mm zoom range. Uh, with this camera I am not going for quality, but um, on the same rig um, on the same tripod there will actually be the directional Yagi Uda antenna for LoRa. This will be this one here. And also the directional Wi-Fi antenna which I have here. So my thinking is that as long as my friend can track the payload we will at least have a chance of getting back telemetry via LoRa and a live image from the Raspberry Pi over Wi-Fi. I'm thinking I'll put this tracking station probably right here. Now speaking of video downlink from the payload, the DJIO for air unit is kind of silly in that as far as I can tell there is no official way to get a video stream out of it other than using a mobile device on the same Wi-Fi, probably with a bunch of latency and some bad compression. But um, luckily there is this program called Cosmo Streamer that runs on a Raspberry Pi and supposedly you can just connect your DJI goggles which will be receiving the RF downlink to the Raspberry Pi and Cosmo Streamer will um, break out the video either over HDMI or any of these flavors of stream over the local network. Um, I haven't tried it yet, but it would be a super nice uh, solution. 
in order to get the goggles away from the other wireless stuff, I will put them atop a C stand, um, probably right about here. Generally, in terms of minimizing RF noise, I will ask the guests to put their phones in flight mode um, right around the launch. And also I will have the DJI SDR wireless image transmissions run on 2.4 GHz and the DJI 04 in the lower range of the 5 GHz band and their directional Wi-Fi AP in the upper range. So just to get them as far apart as possible. Also, wherever possible, I will try to use a narrow bandwidth so, um, for example, 20 megahertz for the 5 gigahertz stuff. For internet connectivity, I'm thinking of using Starlink rather than 5G because it operates in the KA and KU bands. So that's far above 5 gigahertz. Um, but I will still have to test it to see if um, the uplink speeds are fast enough in my area to sustain a live stream. Otherwise, I will have to fall back to a 5G access point. Um, whichever it will be, I will put it. I will also put it on a C stand, probably to the left of the whole um, filling situation, right around here. I think this covers the layout of the launch site. As I have pointed out in the previous video, my two primary concerns for the launch will be safety and regulations. Luckily, the filling and launching operations themselves are not too dangerous because the balloon is still slack at local ambient pressure and even if it pops, nothing too energetic will happen. Nonetheless, I will ask people to stand back a few meters as soon as we have positive neck lift, just in case the payload falls back down and the parachute doesn't have time to fully open. Concerning safety for the flight and landing, I will make sure that the APRS transmitter works properly and I will be running regular trajectory predictions um, up until the launch to make sure that the landing zone is in a sparsely populated area. On the regulatory side, as we have discussed in the previous video, we will be covered by launching more than five kilometers away from the nearest airport, not launching more than two kilos using helium and not hydrogen, and having an adequate personal liability insurance. Again, these are the rules for Switzerland and they will probably be different in your part of the world. So what happens after the launch? 10 or so minutes after release, we will conclude the live stream and start packing up, which will take a moment because it's a lot of stuff. And once everybody has cleared out, me and my girlfriend will start driving in the general direction of the GPS location we are getting back from the payload. In the past, these recoveries have always played out a little differently, which is also part of the fun. Uh, the first one landed up um, pretty far in the Alps, so we couldn't recover on the same day and I had to return the following day geared up for a 7 hour hike. Another one landed in the middle of a lake, so my girlfriend went out on a stand-up paddle and retrieved the thing that way. And some of the more boring ones landed just in the middle of a plain old field. My point is that it's a good idea to be prepared for anything. Definitely bring some water, snacks, sunscreen, a headlamp, sturdy shoes, a raincoat, insect spray, first aid kit and just, you know, general outdoor adventure stuff. Um, also a knife and a bag to cut free and recover um, the payload and all of the debris is a good idea. And also just generally, if it looks dangerous, don't recover because some photos from the stratosphere and some telemetry isn't worth any risk. So far we have been able to recover all previous payloads and I'm sure looking forward to this recovery attempt too. But until then, a lot of assembly and preparation has to happen, so I better get back to it. I would like to thank PCBWay for being an awesome sponsor and such a big part of this project and thank you very much for all your kind words and your support as it really helps me get through these long days leading up to the launch. In the next video I'll report back with a progress update for hardware assembly. Until then, thank you very much for watching, let me know if you liked this video and I'll see you in the next one.